Hello, this is Public Advocate and I'm Shirley Graves. We're trying something new uh, this month. We have never had a traveling public advocate, but we have all traveled down to the Marin History M Museum in downtown San Rafael, and we're going to have a tour of their current exhibit, Antique Toys, Time to Play at the Marin History Museum. And we're going to play with <laughs> the executive director here, Mary Alberici. And in being perfectly honest and, and, and uh, full admittance here, uh, this is my daughter. But that has nothing to do with why we're here, of course, because she, has, uh, she is the director of this museum. And Mary's going to tell us, uh, welcome us to the museum, and tell us a little bit about the, uh, the background and the current exhibit. Great, thank you very much. I'm glad to have you here. You're in the historic Boyd Gate House in San Rafael. And this has been the home of the Marin History Museum since the late 1950s. This home is actually one of Marin's fabulous architectural jewels, built in 1879 as a guest house for the family that occupied what is now the Boyd, Gate House, Boyd Park and the Elks Club. So the Marin History Museum operates two sites, one here in the Boyd Gate House where we have programs, offices, a library and uh, exhibits, which you'll see today and also a collections facility in San Rafael where we have our collection staff and we have all of our artifacts and uh, memorabilia. Uh, interns come in from the colleges around here, from Dominican, from College of Marin, and they work with us on preserving and caring for the collection. The Marin History Museum itself was started uh, back in 1935 mm -hmm. and it was a volunteer-run organization for, for most of its life. and. Uh, so uh, I came on board in 1997 as the first um, executive director, and we've been growing the organization ever since. And you commented before how, how well uh, the group of volunteers preserved all of the artifacts here over all those years when they didn't really have a place for them, yes. and how wonderful things that you have from the early part of the century here. It's really part of San Rafael. Absolutely. Yes. I mean, it was the volunteers who made sure we had a collection so that we can use today to tell our story. Um, in fact, a, a good portion of the museum's resources go to preserving and caring for the collection. This is sort of behind the scenes work that you don't see too often. And then we have the opportunities to hold exhibits such as this. We also collaborate with other organizations in Marin County. We did an exhibit last year on Dorothea Lang that was um, at, up at the Marin Community Foundation, and we worked with the Marin Arts Council to um, run that exhibit. And we had a number of programs, mm -hmm. worked with the uh, California Film Institute to show a uh, program on, on uh, Dorothea Lang. So that was a real success for us. We also do um, oral histories, interviewing and videotaping um, longtime Marin residents. And, uh, we have a museum in a trunk, our hands-on history trunk that is being developed to take out to the schools. And that's very exciting for the kids to actually see an artifact and understand how it was used. Um, it, you know, so many of us got into uh, preserving the history here because we really believe it, how important it is to remember the past, how, how it influences the future, how you can learn from mentors from the past and see what people were able to accomplish in their lives the um, struggles they faced and the way they were to, the way they were able to live their lives and that just can be so inspirational for children today. Also, history really is a way to bring the community together. As we understand what each of the different people who are in the county have brought to the community, how they've added to our heritage, um, and how what we've done in the past affects what is happening today, it can help us come together as a community, help us understand each other and really plan for the future. And I think children especially will enjoy this exhibit because uh, and they'll, they'll learn that going to museums are fun. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> and our audience is going to get a tour of the museum too. Uh, first, Mary, your, your background, of course, uh, has always been in history, right? Yes. Your, your education was? Uh, yes, yes. Um, I received my master's degree from Sonoma State University in history. And um, what was fun for me is that my master's uh, project was studying Winston Churchill as a painter. And it was a wonderful way to learn about a person in history. Uh, it was a very approachable aspect of his life. Um, I was fortunate to earn the um, university's writing award for this. And it's actually led me um, around the country, as you know, because you've accompanied me to a number of the lectures I've given. And to England. To England. Um, I was invited to lecture at Chartwell on Churchill's paintings. This was Churchill's home. And up in Canada with his daughter, Mary Soames. 
And I think really my study of Churchill is one of the pivotal, pivotal moments for me in understanding how important history is. Because here is somebody from the past, and you're looking at what can you learn about this man today? And you, this is where you can talk about mentors from the past, whether it's Winston Churchill or a farmer out in West Marin or a, a dairy man here. You really can see how they live their lives and you know, aspire to achieve some of what they've achieved. Well, we are going to um, uh, have an, a tour of this museum. Are we ready to start our tour? Well, yeah, we have a, well, just to let you know a little bit, we, we wanted to have a program for the summer that was going to really be inviting to families. And so we changed out the entire museum. We had a, we had a lovely exhibit here about Louise Boyd, mm -hmm. and I do invite you to learn a little bit more about her. She's our famous Arctic explorer. And uh, we have a number of, we have quite a bit of her artifacts and we have some wonderful publications. But we did take down the Louise Boyd exhibit so that we could bring in a new exhibit that's filling the museum. And uh, Don Laurent, our curator, will show that to you. One of the things I did want to mention though is that this is, exhibit is made possible through generous sponsorships from the community, from the corporations out there. And I just wanted just to say a quick thank you to um, Mount Tamalpais Mortuary and Cemetery, Historic Business in Marin, the Dutra Group, the Shuttle Inc., Bank of Marin Community Fund, and Infineon Raceway, who really made this possible, along with our board of directors and volunteers. So yes, I think this would be time to, to come play. And, and the, um, the toys were from your collection of? <laughs> <laughs> well, and Dawn's going to tell you a little bit okay, more about that, but, right, the, we'll just, but uh, the, the, to the toys, there's nothing incestuous here. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> The toys come from my mother and father, and uh, my father always collected antique toys, and I played with uh, most of these in here. In fact, uh, we have many disputes and discussions about which toys really were mine. <laughs> so. I know that's still going on, yeah. but uh, yes, we were happy to cooperate and, and loan as much as, as uh, they wanted, and th they have a wonderful exhibit here, and we're going to get to see each piece. And thank you very much, Mary. Oh, and thank we'll, you. And we'll talk to you after our tour. Wonderful. To take us on a tour of this wonderful exhibit, which uh, comprises several rooms of the museum here, uh, we are going to be the guest of Don Laurent, the curator at the museum. Don, you've done a wonderful job here. I am just so, so impressed. And, and I well, live with you. these things. Thank but you. It, it's just a fine job of the labeling and, and uh, sorting and the information you've imparted. Where, uh, where did you learn all this? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I have been working in and around museums for over 25 years, um, primarily in the Bay Area. Um, I got my bachelor's degree in art history and archaeology at UC Santa Cruz, mm -hmm. and then did some internships in San Francisco at the Museum of Modern Art, and um, I've worked for exhibit design companies, and I've been working for the uh, museum here for almost six or seven years now. Um, and so we've, we've, I've really learned a lot about designing exhibits, um, writing the text and the, and the material, pulling together the artifacts, and so it takes a lot of skills to pull the exhibi exhibit together. It's almost like producing a show, um, if, you know, just the show must go on no matter what. So we, we bring in a lot of different talents. I'm not the only one who works on the show. We have a lot of other people who, who help us, and um, so we have really enjoyed putting this exhibition together. This um, uh, Time to Play Early 20th Century Toys is a survey of toys made popular um, from the early 1900s through the 1950s. And um, what we're going to do next is look at some of the cases and we're going to look at some of the certain toys, uh, talk a little bit about their history. So would you like to start that I now? I certainly okay. would and I'm Great. amazed at the, at the research you've done and uh, of, on manufacturers and dates, and uh, it, it's very impressive. Well, we worked with a lot of the, um, we worked with some private collectors in Marin County, and Jeff Graves and Shirley Graves, um, one of our uh, largest donors to this exhibit. We have over 400 toys displayed um, in the museum right now, and uh, we also worked with uh, Mickey McGowan, who's another collector of toys, and um, we have a lot of lenders who have given us a few things here and there. Mm -hmm. This uh, case here represents some of our, our oldest toys in the exhibit. When we're talking about toys in the 1900s that were pushed or pulled or wound up. There was no battery operated. There was no electronics at that time. 
So in this case, you see a lot of wood toys, paper toys, um, early metal and tin, and um, cast iron. And um, something like this toy, which is from the early 1900s, is called a bell toy. It's made of cast metal, and it has bell by the wheels, and when it's pulled, it makes a sound. Another very early toy is this peacock. Um, this is from Germany, and it's also from the early 1900s, and it's a wind-up. When you wind it up, the little legs move. There are several of these early wind-up toys in this case, and um, some of them made in Germany, some of them made in the United States, but they're all in the early 1900s. Um, we also have a collection of cast iron and metal banks, and the interesting thing about these banks is there's a little bit of history attached. There's a, a phone, so some children coming into this exhibit may not know what a phone looked like from the 1920s, and then here it is. This is a Boy Scout and a police officer bank. We have um, Charles Lindbergh here, the Charles Lindbergh Bank. So a lot of these toys are representing history, and that's the main, one of the main themes about this exhibition is that um, you can look at history through the eyes of these toys and how toys are a miniature version of the time period that they're presented in. So materials changed, manufacturing techniques changed, and also popular media. Now in this case here, <coughs> it's called our character case because these toys represent early comic strips, radio, TV, later on TV, and movies. So you have something like uh, Uncle Wiggly, a uh, tin wind-up, or uh, Popeye and olive oil, which is also tin. When you uh, wind it up, it's called a jigger, so they shake. And these are toys that children would have been very familiar with because they saw them in their comic strips and radio, and then later moved to uh, to TV and movies. There are, there are some characters down here that most people would recognize. We've got, um, we've got, uh, <laughs> we've got boxing Felixes here. These boxing Felixes are an early uh, composite wood. Now this is before plastic, and um, they were trying to make some toys that they could form and paint, and then there's a lacquer on top. And then here's a Felix the Cat, which most people might recognize today. And um, Little Miss Muffet. Um, we have um, some of the Disney characters, Pluto and Mickey and a Mickey Mouse. And then here's Donald Duck in an early, this is a rubber. So after tin, cast iron and some of the tin plastics and then rubber started being used for for making toys. So in this case here, you get this full range from the 1900s through the early 1950s of different materials that were used in toy production. Um, I also wanted to just point out these two characters here because these are both made out of a material called celluloid. And celluloid was also a very sort of one of the first attempts at making plastic. It's very lightweight and very fragile. And these are very rare. There aren't a lot of celluloid toys um, uh, around today. Now in this case, we have a collection of dollhouse furniture. Some of the earliest um, furniture was made of cast iron. And I was told by Jeff Graves, who's the collector of this um, cast iron stove, that you could actually put a little pieces of coal in here and, um, and heat it up. And so we have little pans and a coal bin here. This is a coal bin. And um, this is also iron here. This is a early wash machine. So a lot of, again, children coming in today wouldn't really recognize what these are in a carpet sweeper. And down here are, these are the first plastic toys. This was, um, these were made by a company called Renwell. 
and um, these were made in the 1930s. So this was the very first plastic toys that came out, and you can see this little rocking chair, um, a tricycle, and the sewing machine, which was an early pedal sewing machine. And then this is a combination of, of wood and plastic. So these were the, this was the family that would have come along with um, the plastic set. On the other side, we have um, a combination. There's some old building blocks, and these blocks range from early 1900s through the 1940s. So some of these are, are really early blocks, and then going into more modern times. And this is a delightful Ferris wheel that is tin with lithographed images on it. You can see the lithographed children that's pressed design on the tin. And this is also from the 1930s. Um, a few of my favorites <laughs> are, this is Gigi the penguin, and she's made in France in the 1920s. And we have the box that goes with it which shows Gigi walking and flapping her wings. So this is a wind-up. Now, a lot of these are wind-ups here. The giraffe, the elephant, this elephant here, and the Ferris wheel also. When you wound it up, it, it actually moved. And um, on, the bottom, on the bottom shelf here, something that, again, children today may not have recognized as the, this early skates with a skate key that you would adjust and the leather piece that goes around your shoe. In this case, we have our toy soldiers and military uh, toys. And some of the interesting um, toys in this case are the Spitwad shooter cannon. Um, Spitwads were not included. And then there's also a, a, a blimp, the layman. It's a German blimp made by Marx. Um, there's a combination of World War I, World War II soldiers from the United States, England. We also have um, down below the Scots Guards, which still look very much the same today. Um, Japanese soldiers, uh, Russian. So this company, Britons, made soldiers representing all, all armies all over the world. And this is just a very small, minute uh, sample of the thousands and thousands of soldiers that produced. Originally, they were produced in lead, but lead, is, they realized, wasn't good for uh, using for children uh, with toys. And so they, they started to do this cast metal with some movable arms, some stationary. And so it's just a nice representation of, of different types of soldiers that were available and were highly collectible during the, the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Well, Don, now what's in this room? It's another big room all full of little things. That's right. Well, this gallery brings us into the, the 20s, 30s, 40s, and then the early 1950s. So right before World War II and after World War II, there was a lot of advancement in technology. Um, radio moved into TV. So a lot of the characters that were made popular on the radio, such as Gene Autry, um, Tom Mix, Tim McCoy, um, started to, to move into uh, TV programs. And in this case, we have the Western theme was very popular, as was the uh, space theme. So outer space, um, anything that showed modern space exploration. Um, one, of, one of our favorite items is the space pilot suit. So children could dress up like their favorite space pilot or their favorite Western hero. We have Gene Autry Spurs. And of course, the cap guns and, um, and the guitar. So you, you had everything you need to be the lone cowboy riding on the, uh, the planes. And um, down below here, we've got some really interesting um, metal toys. Now these, again, are wind-ups. This is a Buck Rogers space, spaceship. And then some of the, um, uh, this is also Buck Rogers. These are the battleship cruisers. And these were meant to to um, actually fly on a line. So if you had a very thin string or line, you could um, hook the top of it on there, and they would fly across the room. And then there's different assortments of ray guns, 
G-Man and, and, and X-ray guns that the kids would use to, to play their favorite um, uh, superhero. Um, we also have some of the first battery-operated toys, which came out in the, um, in the mid-1950s. After the war, Japan became the premier toy maker. They learned how to, um, to use batteries, but they hadn't figured out how to sit the batteries inside the toy. So you'll notice that the toys are all sitting on boxes. And this one in the front is an external battery case for the dog. And really, most of these toys, their, their hands would move, their head might move a little bit. Um, this one is drinking milk, the little bear is drinking milk. And um, so anyway, these are, are representative of the first battery-operated toys that, that started to be produced in the early 1950s. Down below is a collection of, of sand toys. Um, again, very simple, but, but still very classic as far as kids go today. Um, bucket and shovel, but you'll notice the Western theme is still popular on the, uh, the shovel. And um, in the back is uh, you put sand in the funnel and the children move up and down on the teeter-totter. Now this one next to it is not a sand toy, it's a gravity toy. And with this one, you, you hold it, turn it upside down, and the children uh, move back and forth on the seesaw. There's another sand toy in the back, and this is a boat that would be pulled on the sand, the sand boat. And over here, we have um, the classic spinning tops and yo-yos. And um, yo-yos have apparently been used throughout history, way before Duncan made the imperial yo-yo here in the United States. Um, but um, we have some classic Duncan yo-yos here. And the wood tops with the metal, these metal tips, and that's how you would battle um, each other, because these little tips would actually knock your opponent out of, out of the circle. And then in the back are some spinning tops with circus themes. And these are all ranging in the from the 30s, 40s, and 50s. And the Overland Express train back here is another early battery-operated toy. And in this case, um, they have put the, the battery case inside the, the train itself. Another, another few fun toys to point out here are the robots. Um, along with the whole space theme and technology and modernism, um, robots became popular as a toy. So we have Zoomer, Zoomer the robot, the red and, and gray. Um, it's also battery operated from Japan. And this right over here, this guy is television robot. And he, um, he's also from made in Japan. So these are two of the earliest robots that were mass produced for, for the market in the 50s. And no toy collection would be complete without toy cars, planes, and boats. And in this case, is a sample of different uh, styles and materials that were used in making these toys. Um, we have very early matchbox cars. And, um, and then one of the, I think some of the more unusual toys are the rubber. Because rubber was something, it was a new ma material that um, they were experimenting with in the 30s for all sorts of things, tires and everything. So these toys here, this one, and then you notice the rubber wheels, these white wheels um, represent toys from the 20s and 30s. So they're some of the, the more unusual ones. The thing about the rubber is it's very soft material, and over time it starts to sag. So you can always tell when the wheels are original because most of them have melted a little bit on the bottom, like with this uh, roadster here. And that's a cast metal with rubber. Um, my favorites in this case are really the, the garage. Here you have a, a drive-up garage with the gas lights. Now, there's a, this is also battery operated. So in the oil grease uh, cupboard uh, would be the battery. And then the gas lights would, would light up. Car drives through. And then that's from the 30s. And then coming over here, more of the, the 50s, um, you get the roadside diners with the gas stations and the little diner attached. And this just represents that classic, you know, 1950s, take your dream on the road, the American dream. And this is the classic diner look. So I just love this, uh, this little toy here. 
So we have another room with some games on display. And um, these are, now a lot of these games and, uh, and card games are familiar to some of us because we have, for instance, um, a Mr. Potato Head. Now this was the first toy to be advertised on television. <laughs> and originally you had to use your own potato or cucumber or apple or banana. So I'm sure a lot of moms all across the country were figuring out that their vegetables and fruit were disappearing because Mr. Potato Head toy came into the house. Um, the other thing that's kind of funny to note is because we still have Mr. Potato Head today, the pieces are a lot larger today. When they first came out, they were very small, and I'm sure that you know, children tried to swallow them or whatever, so now they make them bigger. And Mr. Potato Head's pipe was taken away because that was not politically correct. So there are some changes to um, the Potato Head lineage. But that's one of the first ones that came out in 1950s. Um, this is a cute game here. This is Tony and Jocko. It's an animal shooting game. It comes with the cork gun and the little corks. And the idea is to shoot the monkeys off of Jocko's hands. We have a cootie. So some, some may recognize the cootie game. And um, we have Ball and Jacks up here, um, Rockets to the Moon. There's some, um, well, the Nancy Drew mystery game. This will be popular because of the Nancy Drew uh, movie that's just coming out. But the little cards um, showing you know, weird music being played. Place two markers at Blackwood Hall. And there's little cars and markers that come with the game here. Um, let's see what else is in this case that's fun. Well, this is one of my favorites because most children today, when you think of hazards of being a child, geese chasing you and biting you is not one of them. But when this uh, game came out in the late 20s or early 20s, you know, there were, it was a more rural um, setting and so you did have geese that were wandering around and these are little markers and um, little cups for your markers. And the idea is to go around the board and try not to get bitten by the geese. Um, down on the level here, this, this bottom of the case, we've got pickup sticks, tinker toys, um, this beautiful um, Meccano steam shovel actually did work. You put alcohol in this vessel here and, and you um, lit it and it moved the machinery. So it was an actual steam powered toy. Uh, Meccano was um, an English company and um, it was similar to the Erector set, which was the American company, um, A.C. Gilbert. And so these construction toys were very, very popular. And the gentleman who it lent us this steam shovel, um, he said that he played with these toys when he was a child and he became an engineer. And finally, we have the classic Slinky which uh, some of us may remember when it first came out was made of metal and had that wonderful slinky sound that we all love so much. And to show us around this room, we're going to talk again to the executive director of the museum, Mary Alberici. Thank you and uh, welcome to our playroom. We really wanted to make this inviting for families to bring their children. And we also wanted an opportunity for the kids to learn a little bit more about the toys while having fun with it. So we begin here at the activity table where we have uh, paper doll cutouts. This was so popular, especially beginning in the 1920s. And uh, children are able to come in and cut out these, these historic representations. We also have the paper airplane making station. <laughs> And we use, the, um, we use an image from our collection from Ed Brady Aero Photography as our paper for making the airplanes. We've had a, one of the exhibits we did, we had the kids come out and make paper airplanes and then see how far they could fly them out in the park. So it was a lot of fun and it's great to see the, the kids come in and have something that they can touch and, and handle and, and create something that their, their grandmother would have enjoyed very much. 
then coming over here, we wanted to represent the uh, toys in the exhibit and how they changed through time when the different materials were invented. And this begins in the 1920s with painted wood. This was a handmade truck. And then we move into the 1930s, die cast metal. And in the 1940s, we have tin with a lithograph design on it. 1950s, we have hard pressed rubber. And then in the 50s and 60s, we get into the die cast metal and plastic. And you'll notice these don't come off. The idea is for kids to come see these and understand a little bit about the material and then go out into the exhibits and find them out in the exhibits. We have um, board games represented on here because these were just such popular classic toys for the children. In here we have hands-on toys for the, for the children to pull out and, and play with the, the, the wooden blocks and, and uh, the um, old trains here. We have wooden trains, pull toys, all things that they're going to see out in the exhibit, but they can come in and actually touch these. It's no fun to come see a toy exhibit if you can't touch. And what, what's so important here is that kids want to touch things. They need that tactile experience. I mean, we have technology coming in and we have so many electronics, mm -hmm. but throughout time, things you can touch and play with, the construction toys, the dolls, the board games, these are going to be uh, popular just throughout time for the children. One of the things here, we have, of course, some of the um, nursery rhymes. We have Dick and Jane. And then this is the modern day edition of Mrs. Potato Head. And this one, you don't actually have to have a potato in your hand to do it. But this way, kids can see this and then go see what, ha what their father or grandfather would have played with out in the other room. I would like to introduce Carlton Prince, who is Senior Vice President at Circle Bank and the incoming president of the board of the Marin History Museum. He has some messages for you from the board. Well, welcome everyone. I hope you enjoyed today's uh, tour. I think Don and Mary showed you some uh, terrific toys that we have here at this exhibition. Um, I think you should know that in addition to just the artifacts, these toys that we've seen here today, what's really important is the story behind the toys. And that's what the Marin History Museum is really all about. It's the, it's the human side of the artifacts themselves. And the museum has a very important role to play in both collecting and preserving and archiving uh, various materials that represent the history of Marin County from the early days up till today. But the real point is that all those things represent our history and the things that led up to who we are today. Uh, history is not a, a point in time, it's actually a continuum, and we're part of that continuum. And so what we look for in the museum is to make sure that we're linking uh, the elements that represent our past through these toys and through the other artifacts that we have with what it really means to us today. Uh, because after all, you know, t tomorrow's history is really happening right now today. And we are creating that history on a daily basis. We say history is happening. That's what this museum really represents. And in addition to the building here in the Boyd uh, Gatehouse where we are, uh, the museum's real role also is to reach out to the community as a whole to integrate other uh, historical societies here in Marin County and to be a, a service to them, to provide resources, information, and also be able to take in some of their collections and house them and archive them properly because we have the facilities for that, and then be able to redistribute them to the society. It doesn't do any good as a museum to, to gather up uh, uh, artifacts or historical items if you can't access them. So what we're really trying to do is, in addition to the preservation and archiving of these materials, is also make them accessible to the community through electronic means, through our exhibitions, through reaching out to the schools, and through displays that we will be having in other uh, institutions around the community, from Fireman's Fund up in Novato, down to the Tiburon and Sausalito. So we welcome your participation. We welcome, uh, you know, the, if you're a corporation, we certainly welcome your participation there and your sponsorship. We have lots of activities and programs that we would you know, certainly appreciate uh, your contributions to. But more importantly, it's really a people's museum. This is really representing all of us here in Marin County, the history that we know and the history that is we're leaving for our a legacy for our own children. So welcome again, and uh, I appreciate your coming today. We look forward to seeing you here at the Marin History Museum. Well, now that we've piqued your interest, I hope you'll come down and visit us. Come celebrate your heritage. Come connect with your community. You can become a member, you can volunteer, or you can participate in any of our programs. Our next Family Day program will be Saturday, July 21st from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. We'll have the children's activity room open. 
will be, uh, our theme that day is going to be jump, uh, jump ropes and, and jacks. It'll be a lot of fun. We will also have that same day a walking tour of historic downtown San Rafael. That will be from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. and it meets right here at the Boyd Gatehouse. Our museum right now is in the Boyd Gatehouse, which is in Boyd Park at Mission and B Streets in San Rafael. We're open Tuesday through Friday from 11 to 4. So come on by and see us and please check out our website at marinhistory.org. And uh, I really want to say a special thank you to Jeff Graves for sharing his toys with us. He asked me just recently when he's going to get them back to play with. <laughs> and I want to thank Shirley and the Public Advocate for allowing us this opportunity to tell you about our programs and invite you to come join us. Thank you, Mary. And I want to say a big thank you to the museum, to all the people that cooperated to put this show on, and all the people that cooperated to set up all of these wonderful exhibits. Mm -hmm. We appreciate everything that you've done and, uh, and, and putting uh, together a program so the audience could see that, that too. Um, this pro public advocate is on Novato Public Access Television uh, Wednesdays at 8 p.m through July 11, this particular show, and it is on the first Monday in August over Marin Channel 26 at 6 p.m. We invite you to watch anytime. This is Shirley Graves, and this is Good Evening for Public Advocate. <laughs>